We're here to talk about this groundbreaking report that Amnesty has published in the last few days, uh, a report that's made a lot of noise um, for the right reasons, of course, even though you've no, been so attacked uh, also, but this was planned and expected. The report is 280 pages. So for people that haven't read it yet, uh, there's, there's obviously an executive summary that it's much shorter. But it, so 280 pages means you go very deep into the analysis, right? It's not like a, a PR, a press release or anything. It's a very detailed uh, report. But I, I, I was wondering if you had like a couple of minutes to explain to someone what's the report about. And, you know, if you want, if you had to explain to people, I want you to take those three or four points out of this report, uh, what would you tell them? So the report um, makes a very strong watertight case that Israel is imposing a system of oppression and domination that amounts to apartheid and perpetrates the crime against humanity of apartheid against Palestinians in all areas under the control of Israel, meaning Israel and occupied Palestinian territories, and with direct effect on Palestinian refugees outside of this territory, particularly in preventing them the right to return to their homes. The system that is imposed, the system of apartheid, is made up of basically four main pillars. The first is fragmentation, fragmenting Palestinians into different groups, different geographies, not allowing them to connect and be just one collective. Two, segregation and control. It is when Palestinians are pushed into enclaves and controlled within these enclaves and in between the enclaves, particularly uh, uh, controlling the right to freedom of movement, for example. Uh, four, three, sorry, it's uh, dispossessing of land and property. It's the land regime that Israel has put in place to take property, particularly land, in a racist way from Palestinians and not allowing them also in a discriminatory manner access to that land. And four, it's the uh, deprivation of rights, particularly uh, social and economic rights. So what the report does is it relays on more than 20 years of Amnesty's documentation of patterns of violations by Israel against the Palestinians. And it does also new documentation within the context of writing this report, which took four years, uh, going back to some of the cases, case studies, including individuals and communities, which Amnesty has documented violations against and campaigned on or for, uh, for many years, including, for example, Homsa and Hedidiya, north of the Jordan Valley, if you want, which are kind of semi-nomadic hamlets uh, that uh, Israel is continuously targeting targeting them with dispossession of, uh, of property and demolition of, of, of their homes and uh, uh, harassment by the uh, army, uh, including, for example, carrying out military exercises in where these communities live. So Amnesty has documented the violations against these communities for now, I think it's more than 15 years, uh, continuously and campaign for the protection of rights of Humsa and Hadidiyya and are right now, for example, uh, in this report as a case study. And we also kind of carried out documentation of the recent violations that uh, they've, uh, they've had to endure uh, during the course of writing this report. So it's extensive documentation relaying both on what we've done before and fresh documentation, plus legal analysis of this documentation uh, in the framework of international law, particularly the crime of apartheid, uh, and how these violations connect with each other. So what the report also presents makes the case for, with, in relation to the crime against humanity is it says, this is a system in place. And to maintain this system, Israel perpetrates crimes, including forcible transfer, arbitrary detention and torture, unlawful killings, and the deprivation of basic rights or persecution against the Palestinians in order to maintain the system of oppression and domination. So therefore, apartheid in the report is both a system and a crime at the same time. They're there with an intent that is very clear. It's clear in the laws, policies, and practices, but also 
in the statements of Israeli officials from the creation of the state until today, which basically says that Israel intends to maintain Jewish Israeli hegemony in terms of demography and geography in lands under its control. So basically always maintaining more Jewish Israelis than Palestinians in, in these areas and maximum control over land in this area, whether it is Israel or the occupied Palestinian territories. An important note to clarify, while we do find that apartheid as a system, as a crime, exists today in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, in order to understand it, and this is what took us a lot of time, and there's you know, extensive analysis of this, you need to look at the root causes of what we have today. And in studying the root causes and carrying out you know, study of laws, policies, and practices, it takes us back to 1948, the establishment of the state of Israel as a Jewish state and democratic, it says in, in its declaration. Uh, and then the military rule that it imposed on Palestinians who, yes, were given citizenship, but were maintained as second class, if not you know, third and fourth class citizens, and under an arbitrary military rule that is imposed only on them and no one else, only the Palestinians and no one else under uh, what has become Israel. And then the land regime, the laws that were put in place to basically confiscate Palestinian private property, particularly uh, to mention here the absentee property law, which is the law that was passed in 1952 to allow the state to take the properties of the refugees uh, Palestinians who were forcibly displaced during the Nakba or ethnic cleansing uh, around the time of the establishment of the state and to move these properties into uh, the control of the state, including those who remained there. For example, the report presents the case of Iqrit, which is a village uh, in the north that Israel has forcibly, uh, forcibly transferred its population to nearby. They never left the area, they never left what became Israel. Uh, they remained a few kilometers away, but until now are unable to return to their village uh, or to reclaim back their lands. So you see how, you know, in, 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 in looking at the situation now, you need to go back to what happened then to fully understand the extent uh, of the system and the effects of this crime on Palestinians, both as citizens of Israel and as residents in the occupied Palestinian territories and as refugees. Uh, outside. Thanks, Ali. Uh, you know what, what's interesting, I guess, uh, you know, when you think about the response to this report, um, a lot of people, plenty of people have welcomed it, obviously the Palestinians first, and obviously you got attacked by Israeli officials, by uh, supporters of Israel all around the world, including in the US. But what's interesting, and, and I think Chris uh, McGrail in The Guardian wrote about this in the couple of, you know, a couple of days ago, yeah, yesterday, I think, is that if you listen to the declarations of Israeli officials, you know, from 48 until now, if you read some of the laws, you know, of, of Israel, um, if, you know, Israel doesn't have a constitution, but, you know, the basic laws are, in a way, a constitution, there is a word in Hebrew called afrada. Afrada in Hebrew means separation. Separation means apartheid. So why is it that if you look at the facts, many Israeli officials support have called it the way it was, apartheid, for many years. But now that Amnesty has published this report, everyone is coming against Amnesty as being anti-Semitic and the rest. In my view, it's the way that it was used before, it's... Um... Uh, as if a warning, right? Uh, that if you know a course is not corrected, uh, Israel will become an apartheid. If annexation uh, of what remains of the West Bank is seen through, it will be become apartheid. If this, then apartheid. You know, so this is always something to kind of, I, I would say, use a, a, as as a term politically, you know, for, for certain political agendas and, 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 and to, sometimes, you know, to seriously warn perhaps about what may become. Now, what Amnesty is saying is that it, it, it's not going to become apartheid. It is apartheid. 
here and now, and here is a strong case based on uh, professional scientific documentation of patterns of human rights violations and a legal, you know, in-depth legal analysis of laws, policies, and practices, and also statements by Israeli officials that show how Israel has already established a system of oppression and domination over Palestinians, amounting to apartheid, and perpetrated the crime of apartheid uh, against Palestinians, both inside of Israel and in the OPT, right? Um, and now, I guess it, 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 this is the challenge. What amnesties will be working on is to ensure that, this is, that there is a recognition uh, of the situation as it is. You know, we're joining, we're not, we're, we're not new in here. We're, you know, joining the Palestinian organizations, uh, intellectuals and academics who have pioneered uh, this work. They are the first who were using the language, using apartheid as a legal framework to uh, help better understand uh, the situation for what it is and, and called for organizations, including Amnesty, uh, to do its own work vis-a-vis -vis apartheid. And then Israeli organizations and Human Rights Watch last year, last year put out their report making the case that Israel is perpetrating the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. And so now, now Amnesty and what we hope to do by joining is to increase this momentum uh, that is led by civil society organizations at this point to ensure that there's more recognition on four fronts, right? The first is the general public, let's call it, which includes media, academics, uh, journalists, and, and others. Um, the second is third states, uh, those with responsibility, legal responsibility and moral responsibility uh, towards um, uh, the rights of people who are under um, system of oppression and domination amounting to apartheid. Uh, third is international organizations, international and regional organizations. So that is the UN, the EU, African Union, and others. And fourth is businesses. So our, our approach right now is to ensure that this recognition is solid, it's widespread, and it is a beginning of then action. So these third states to act according to their legal obligations, uh, the members of civil society, general public, the media to also act on this recognition to always ensure that the narrative, the way they understand, the way they speak about the situation in Israel, Palestine, uh, ensures that you know there's an understanding and the using of apartheid as a legal framework, um, and also seeing how that apartheid being uh, one of the more extreme forms of violent racism also intersects them with struggles that are uh, right now at the forefront of, uh, you know, uh, situations all around the world, whether it is, you know, in the US with Black Lives Matter or in Europe with Black Lives Matter or, you know, uh, indigenous movement, you know, uh, um, uh, indigenous population movements uh, in, in, you know, settler colonies such as uh, Australia, uh, uh, the United States and Canada. So th this intersectionality is, is, is really important. Uh, for businesses to ensure that they do not do business uh, in a way that contributes to then the system of apartheid or the perpetrating of the crime of apartheid. And of course, you know, coming to the international organizations, the UN, uh, one, if it's at the level of the Human Rights Council, to ensure that the commission of inquiry that was set up last year by the Human Rights Council to investigate uh, apartheid in Israel and Palestine, and it has the mandate to do so. Uh, uh, the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, to include an investigation, uh, 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 apartheid into the ongoing investigation by the Office of the Prosecutor. Um, and also, you know, the EU and the African Union to ensure that then their relationship uh, with Israel does not contribute to uh, human rights violations and the system of apartheid that Israel is imposing. So we're, we're working towards from recognition to action and then from action to accountability. And what accountability looks like is the dismantling of a system. There's no reform. You know, you cannot reform apartheid. You can only, any person who cares for freedom, equality, justice, can only imagine a world without apartheid. You know, that apartheid does not exist. There's no way of making it better. And I think this is what's, what's, what, what's so important here, that there is a situation that nobody can live with. Uh, there's no way of making it normal. It is not normal. It's a moral and legal duty to take you know, action against it, and we must do so immediately. 
I wanted to ask you, um, I, I want to go back to what can we do now and actions. But first, I wanted to ask you, ask you about something very important that actually a lot of people that are not familiar with Palestine and Israel don't really understand. We've had the discuss, this, these discussions in the, in the sort of the solidarity movement with academics, with legal experts for, for 15 years or 20 years now. I remember uh, at least 10, 12 years ago, John Dugard, who are the UN special reporters to the occupied territories, issued a report on apartheid, but it focused only on the West Bank. I was, as you know, I was part of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine. We had this session in Cape Town in 2011 on apartheid. And there was this huge debate on, are we talking apartheid in the West Bank or are we talking apartheid against the Palestinian people with an S to Palestinians? You came out and the report came out with Palestinians with a big S at the end, which means Palestinians in the occupied territory, the West Bank, Gaza. It also means Palestinian citizens of Israel. It also means Palestinian refugees. So this is huge. Why, in your opinion, was it important for you to make this clear distinction? But also, I wanted to ask you, and that's sort of a side question, tr try, because it's not easy, to explain to people the difference between citizenship in Israel itself versus nationality, because people don't understand that. They, they, they don't understand the difference uh, when it applies to Israel. So there's like two questions. Thanks, man. Um, so on, on the first, um, uh, look, when it comes to uh, the visuals of apartheid, it is indeed very much clearer when it comes to the occupied Palestinian territories than it is um, you know, we're looking at Palestinian citizens of, of, of Israel. Although, you know, I, I, I will argue, this is what, what we kind of continuously, what I would argue, you know, the situation in the Naqab for Bedouin Palestinians there is perhaps uh, for some a lot more oppressive in terms of a reality than for Palestinians living in Ramallah like myself. Um, although, you know, Ramallah is under military occupation. It is part of the occupied Palestinian territories. It is surrounded by walls and checkpoints. It gets, you know, raided by, by the army very frequently uh, to carry out arrests in the middle of the night. There are unlawful killings that take place on also a very frequent basis. But if you look at, for example, Ras Jraba, one of the unrecognized villages in, uh, in, in the Naqab Negev uh, desert, uh, these people have been living there for, you know, what they say, centuries, right? For a very, very, very long time. Uh, they have their ways of life, which is a mix between, you know, agriculture and, and, and herding. Um, and, and, and right now, basically segregated into this one place, and they're under threat of demolition of their homes. Uh, they're not given any basic services, like their fellow uh, Jewish citizens who live very close by in Dimona, for example, a city that is being expanded in the south. No electricity, no water, no access to education, no clinics. And even as citizens, they, yes, have the right to vote in municipal and parliamentary elections, but are not provided that infrastructure to do so. Uh, so one can argue that they are actually also prevented from the right to political participation that is granted to them as, as citizens. Uh, how so? They don't have any place to go and vote when there are, for example, parliamentary elections. They would need to be taken by buses and they need to have special registration to be able to do so. And so it just complicates it so that you are not able to carry out the, this right of political participation, similar with the municipal election. So, um, so they, this is a reality that, you know, you, you look at then the body of laws, policies and practices, and you see that it affects Palestinians across, you know, or on, on, on either side of, of the green line. And so to, in order to fully understand the effects of a system and a crime of apartheid against Palestinians, you need to look at it. And, and this is at the core of the definition of apartheid. It's the domination of one group over another. And one group here is the Jewish Israelis and the other are Palestinians. So it is an approach of looking at people rather than at geography. You know, It's not looking at Israel versus the occupied Palestinian territories versus the diaspora. 
It is to see how these people as a whole, and yes, they may live different oppressive realities, how they are equally victims of the system and crime of, of apartheid. Right? And, and this was the approach for us. And this is why it took a long time, because again, the violence of uh, the reality in the OPT may be more visible than the violence of the reality for Palestinian citizens inside of Israel. But, and, 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 and here, you know, I'm uh, paraphrasing something by, you know, that our Secretary General, Inez Kalamar, uh, said that what shocked her the most was not that violence that you could see on Qalandia, in the wall, uh, in the military checkpoints, or the difference between uh, a Jewish-Israeli settlement and a Palestinian community, but rather it's the banality of apartheid, how it has been so entrenched, whether it is in the bureaucracy of having families separated or being able to you know, protect your residency in East Jerusalem or to be able to travel, for example, as a, as a couple or whatever through the airport or you know, someone needs to go to join. It's the banality of apartheid that was perhaps the most shocking for her. And, and it is that, to, to, in order to understand it, we need to understand that Palestinian citizens of Israel were put under a system of oppression and domination from the establishment of the state in 1948 with the imposition of the military rule, which lasted from 48 until 66, the land regime that confiscated their lands and uh, dispossessed them of, of their property uh, and the violations of their civil and political rights then within that period that was never dismantled. There was never a change to that system of oppression and domination. It remained in place and it is right now the system of apartheid that amounts to a crime against humanity that they're also under. And so it, it, you need to understand it fully and in depth in order to tackle it in a meaningful and strategic way. Otherwise, we'll just be basically doing the same as we did before, is trying to address the symptoms of uh, you know, the system rather than going to, uh, to the root causes, which Palestinians, and especially over the last... Uh, year or so have been calling for, you know, with the solidarity protest with the Sheikh Jarrah and how, you know, that turned into an emblematic case. And then the general strike where Palestinians across the geography have observed, you know, not going to work, not going to the schools uh, and saying, you know, we are one. We are fighting against fragmentation and we are one under this system of oppression and domination. It must stop. And so, you know, in order to understand that and be able to respond to this Palestinian call meaningfully, you need to see the situation in a way we call holistically, right? And, and not divided up geographically. And yeah, the second part of the question was different between citizenship and nationality, because like I'm a French national. Uh, how does it apply to, to Israel, for example? Yeah, I guess we, we had this conversation also, also with, uh, with Inez, uh, because she, she is French, and she, she said, you know, this for, for a French person, this is completely absurd. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, that's why, like, people don't get it. And, and, right. I mean, and in a way, for me, explaining this difference explains it all. You don't even have to go much further to explain. I mean, apartheid comes from basic understanding of citizenship and nationality. So, yeah, go ahead. Right, so, so this goes back to uh, some of the... Uh, uh, major laws uh, that have a constitutional value. You know, Israel does not have a constitution, but it has a body of basic laws that make up for and have a constitutional value. Uh, so one of them is the law of return, for example, which allows uh, any Jew from around the world to uh, migrate to Israel and gain citizenship automatically on arrival. Right? So uh, there is also the nationality law, uh, and most recently in 2018, the nation state law, right? And in Israeli law, there's the difference between a national and a citizen. So every national is a citizen, but not every citizen is a national. And nationals are only uh, Jews. Um, Palestinians are, some of them are citizens, uh, but they are never, unless they become Jewish, can become uh, uh, also national and enjoy then the full body of rights, including what? For example, the nation state law in 2018, which was a law that came to kind of crown the body of discriminatory law, says that only, you know, Israel is the state for Jewish people only, and only the Jewish people have the right to self-determination 
in Israel. So here is where you could see this difference, you know, very much embodied in law. And of course, once law, also in practice. Uh, what does self-determination also mean? It means also the enhancement in, as part of the law enhancement of Jewish settlement across the land that Israel controls, meaning Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. So not also the enhancement of settlement, meaning you know, the development of, of, of communities and being able to support the communities so that they, uh, uh, they flourish. You know, it, that, that these rights as enshrined in law are only to the nationals who are only Jewish Israelis and not Palestinians who are only citizen and are unable to enjoy, for example, right to self-determination in the state. Finally, I wanted to go back, that would be my final question, about the actions. And you know, now we've got this amazing report, we've got the Human Rights Watch report, we've got this Betselem report, we've got all the you know info from Palestinian organization like you know Al Haq and and uh, shit, I forgot the names, but anyway, many, many of them that we've worked with in, in the past. You were talking about actions, you know, clear actions towards states, towards third parties, towards, towards corporations. And that's obviously very, very important. But, you know, in 2004, the Israel, uh, the, Israel the International Court of Justice came with a legal opinion against the, the wall, you know, and now we call it the apartheid wall or the separation wall. In this report in 2004, it said that the wall shouldn't be, the wall is illegal, shouldn't, shouldn't have been constructed and should actually be, be demolished. And it also said that third parties and third and states had the obligation to ensure that the wall was going to be demolished. It's now 2022, so nearly 20 years later, the wall is fully built, except I saw that in Al-Ram, Al -Ram, the wall fell, right? Nature took over, which was yeah. <laughs> really an amazing sight. But so it's great to say, you know, we're going to call for actions, but the inaction in a way of the international community, and by this, I mean states, has been incredible when it comes to Israel. In a way, despite reports like the 2004 International Court of Justice report, Israel has been rewarded for, you know, has had like access to European, uh, you know, networks and funds, etc. So how do you intend to actually, with the help of many, this time make a real change? And that'll be sort of my final question. And I know it's not easy, an easy one. So, so uh, Amnesty is a campaigning organization, and it's a movement of, of members. Um, there are 10 million members around the world who will be, or at least a huge part, what we hope a huge part of them will be mobilized to basically push for a campaign that ensures, as I said, kind of recognition at first. So on one hand, what I think is very important um, uh, to specifically audiences in democracies is to have consistent pressure on parliamentarians, members of the parliament to continuously, and not only over the next couple of months, but really for the long haul, over the next few years, to continuously raise questions in parliament, make statements in parliament, call their ministers for questioning about then the relationship, perhaps complicity, um, and their then actions to suppress and punish the crime of apartheid. You know that there is a legal responsibility here that states must must act on, and so we need the pressure from from inside as well as pressure from the outside, right? Meaning that organizations like Amnesty, in partnership with other human rights organizations, will continuously put the pressure on governments uh, through meetings, through questions, through letters. Uh, through reports uh, that would also perhaps, you know, uncover their relationship. So uh, to then take on their responsibility according to international law. There is a momentum that we believe has been built over the next, over, over the last year with, you know, people all around the world moving in action and solidarity with the community in Sheikh Jarrah and Palestinians, right? So, and there was a pointing to root causes. Right, that we shouldn't just deal with the symptoms, that we need to uh, address the root causes. Otherwise, we're just going to have the same cycle repeat over and over again, which we've seen over the many years. Um, that was recognized by the UN with the establishment of a commission of inquiry uh, that is one um, 
uh, evergreen, um, that is permanent. It does not have a time scope where it stops, which is very important. It also includes Israel and not only the OPT in its investigative mandate. And three, that it can move evidence to the International Criminal Court and that that evidence can be used in investigation. So it's a very powerful mechanism. Why I mention it is because in its language, in the setup of the Commission of Inquiry, in its reporting, they will be addressing root causes. We hope that they see apartheid as a framework that would allow them to address root causes effectively and will be pushing them to do so. Um, but it is the root causes and it's a mobilizing then of people from you know, within democracies, especially those who are influential on the global scene and who have uh, relations, ally relations with Israel uh, to have the pressure particularly from civil society and from parliament that can be matched with pressure from the outside so that it becomes really, really hard for them to continue the unconditional support for Israel without, you know, in this impunity and without account for, you know, what we're saying now, this is a crime against humanity that's being perpetrated. No one can stay silent and no one can accept that we live in a world where this is taking place without anybody uh, saying anything about it, at least let alone, you know, take action against it. So let us recognize it for what it is um, uh, and, and let us then take, you know, concrete ac action uh, against it towards the dismantling of the system. So to your audiences, uh, I would recommend alongside the report, we put out an online education, human rights education course. It's 90 minutes. It's available in a number of languages, English, French, Spanish, Hebrew, and Arabic. Hopefully also we can translate it to other languages. It looks at you know, how, what apartheid is under international law. It looks at apartheid in history with a comparative view of Israel, Palestine, South Africa, and Myanmar, which is another situation which, Israel, which Amnesty uh, made a determination that there is a situation of apartheid there against the Rohingya Muslims. And the third part is about the experience of Palestinians under Israel's apartheid. So we hope that this tool would allow uh, you know, wider audiences to be able to access uh, and understand the framework, uh, this legal framework, and be able then to use that in pressuring their representatives in parliament not to let this go and to keep the pressure on their governments until something happens, something cracks. Uh, and this is what we're hoping for. Shukran uh, Saleh. Alan Frank. <laughs> Thanks for... Uh for taking the time to, to explain all this. Um, I will obviously post the links of the report, the course um, in, you know, in the description of the video. So um, yeah, again, Really thank appreciate you. this. Thank, no, thank you for reaching out. And uh, I'm really glad we reconnected. We should keep it up. <laughs>